All right, I got a great show for you today. I have special guest Sean Spicer back for what is this, the third or fourth time? I think so. I, I think it's three. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm excited. We've got a lot going on in the media with the court situation, things that Trump said uh, in the last couple of days. Uh, Democrats, including Chuck Schumer, are now openly saying America needs more illegal immigrants or else the good life is going to implode. At the same time, President Trump is saying we actually need to have the largest deportation of illegals in American history. And new data out this morning shows a majority of Americans, including legal Hispanic immigrants, support the deportation. What are your thoughts on this? You know, the funny thing is it all makes sense. So if you've come to this country legally and followed the law, you want everyone else to do the same thing. So that the latter one first, it makes sense. I don't want everyone else to break the law to come in if I follow the law. So I, I don't see any intellectual discrepancy between that and, and what the polling suggests. Um, because I find it ironic that people want to come to this great nation, um, in many cases from countries where they feel persecuted. And then the first thing that they do is to break our laws, right? So there is just something inherently wrong with saying, I want to escape a country and go to somewhere that has a better system of government, a better life. But the first thing I'm going to do is break the laws of the place that I want to go to, to undermine the rule of law that I think is so great. The second thing that where I think what you said about Schumer is fascinating because, Stephen, I have been focused a lot on my show on words. And what the media and the Democrats do is love to change definitions of words and obscure the real argument. So there is potentially a need for more workers at the lower end. I'm not an economist and I'm not trying to. And, but that's kind of the argument that Chuck Schumer's making, right? Based on what you said. So then what they're doing is making this natural jump to saying, okay, well, then we need to have open borders. I would liken it to this. I have a lot of stuff. My wife uses a different word. I have a lot of stuff in our house that probably needs to be getting rid of. That would like be saying, okay, therefore it's okay to rob my house. It's not, I mean, they're, they're making an intellectual jump that's not true. What Trump is saying is if you came into this country illegally, we're going to send you out. What Schumer is saying was we have a labor shortage problem in a lot of areas, agriculture, et cetera. So therefore, it's OK that you just came into this country illegally. There's no inconsistency in any of these arguments. People who came here legally want people to come here legally. Trump wants people who came here illegally to have to get out first. That doesn't mean that we then can't subsequently have a discussion about where we might need additional workers, who the right people are, et cetera. But you don't just sort of say, okay, I'm going to let people in some, you know, the same way you wouldn't with my analogy. We're saying I have extra things in my house that I need to get rid of. Therefore, it's okay to rob it. Yeah. The, uh, I, I just don't get why they don't uh, work on fixing immigration so that we are actually collecting the best of other countries. Because, because but it's simple. Look, at, I'm, I'm sorry, Stephen. This is where like, I have come to this conclusion and I know a lot of people on the left in the media think like it's because they don't want a real solution. Right. To, to, to my example, if you actually said, who do we need in this country worker wise, um, who makes more sense? It, it doesn't benefit the Democratic Party the same way it does when you do it the way they're doing it, when they allow people to flood in through the border. And then you say, we, the Democratic Party, are going to make sure that you can stay here by the, and against this evil other party that wants to deport you. We're going to give you a driver's license. We're going to give you all of these goodies from the government. That system ensures their long-term viability as a political party. The system that makes sense doesn't. In fact, it may harm them. And I think that that's the fundamental answer. And the more and the quicker that everybody gets in on the joke here, which is this is not about what's right or best. This is about what's going to benefit the Democratic Party and the progressive movement the, the, and, and ensure their long-term viability. That's the answer. And there's no other answer that actually makes sense. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe their biggest worry is if people come here legally, they'll vote Republican. Right. See, that's <laughs> right? it. Exactly. Or that maybe even it's a 50-50 split. 
Yeah. But they 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 don't they are getting a hundred percent of the pie in their minds if they let everyone flood in and say, Hey, remember, we're the guys that took care of you. We gave you this and we're gonna protect you. Think about this. This is the fascinating thing that I've been talking about a lot. We there have been a lot of efforts to crack down on people potentially voting illegally. I have always been of the mind that you protect what you value. A reason that a bank has a vault and a guard isn't because it has been broken into or robbed. It's because it needs to ensure that it doesn't happen, protects what it values. When we talk about voting, the left always says, well, these people, it's against the law to vote illegally, to register to vote. So let me just get this straight. Someone who entered the country illegally, who broke the law, who then was given a driver's license, who was then given a message that said that they'll be deported if they don't take action and vote to ensure that another party doesn't take power, isn't going to break the law again because why? Oh, because it's against the law. I mean, it's it, the argument of the left doesn't hold water. And that's the biggest problem right now is that they they their argument is such that, well, someone who broke the law, they won't do it again because it's against the law, which they just broke. Yeah. Well, another good example of that is uh, Arizona just discovered that they have over 500,000 bad names on their voter rolls, and the Republicans are suing to get those names removed, and the Democrats are suing to keep those names. Like, if that doesn't tell you the priorities of the two major parties, I don't know what else does. Right. Well, again, why why is it when you institute something like voter ID or cleaning the rolls that you're bringing up, why would you protect that if you didn't have ulterior motives? And that's the at the end of the day, again, it just comes down to what are you really trying to achieve? And they're showing their true colors over and over again. The only reason they get away with any of this is through a complicit media. Right. That's that's the bottom line. If you know that no one's going to uh, it's kind of like why when people ask me all the time about what's going on in the White House and the press corps, the answer I give them is that if you could get away with what they I mean, hell, if I could have gotten away with it, if I could say certain things and know that there was no level of accountability or follow up, I would say or do things. They know that there's none and they know this for the entire left. I mean, again, any curious journalist would say, well, that doesn't make sense. Why wouldn't you want to clean up the rules to make sure that dead people, people that aren't here legally, et cetera, that are duplicitous, that moved out of state, aren't still voting here in Arizona? The yeah. only reason that makes sense is if you actually needed them. <laughs> um, in the last 48 hours, two big things came out. Uh, one, uh, over 10,000 people have been laid off in California for the new mandated $20 an hour fast food minimum wage. At the same time, President Trump said uh, when he gets back in office, it's time to eliminate taxation on your tips. If you do a good job in the hospitality industry or the food services industry, the restaurant industry, the government shouldn't be taking your tips. There's about 20 million people that work those jobs every single day. What are your thoughts? Is that going to grab some votes? Well, he said it in Nevada, which probably might because it's a service industry focused economy there. Um, I think there's some merit to this if it's done correctly. What do I mean by that? Well, look, I mean, I've been in Washington too long to know that once you create a little hole, a bunch of lobbyists are going to figure out how to drive a truck through it. I would suggest that you would say if you make below a certain level um, and then add a certain amount of tips. So like, let's say up to 60,000 or 70,000 or some number, again, I'll, I'll let the smarter people determine what makes sense. Then that might be a smart move uh, and an incentive for people to get back into the economy in a way that helps the service industry. Um, although it's, it is funny, I total side note, pet peeve. I don't know where you come down on this, but everywhere I go now, it doesn't matter. I feel like if I'm going to Home Depot, they turn the little reader around and ask for a tip now. Um, so I think that Trump, but, but th this gets to so many things. I I'll leave it at this. It's, it's Trump knows how to read people and crowds better than anybody else. He's been in the service industry, the restaurant business, golf courses, hotels, 
And I think he realizes that this is something that really plays with them. So that was smart. The first thing that you brought up, though, I'm so glad you touched on it because this is I love politicians who go in to solve a problem, i.e. we're going to raise the minimum wage to help you. And what happens? They all get fired. The restaurants close down over and over and over again. And for so many of these restaurants, fast food restaurants in particular, they are the gateway for so many people into the economy. They're the first job of many people. They're the part-time job of many people. So when you eliminate them, you're actually hurting the people that you intended to help the most. Now, here's the bigger problem. The message that they're going to get is we should probably now, because more people are out of work, we should double the minimum wage again to help the people that are out of work that we put out of work so that when they go back to work from the jobs that we eliminated, that they get a higher pay, even though more jobs will be eliminated, there'll be fewer jobs to go to. They will never, ever get the right answer because they are fundamentally misguided as to how the economy works. And so many people, I think Joe Biden falls into this category, have never actually been on the flip side of a paycheck. They've never had to sign one. They don't know what it's like to actually employ people and to have to worry about how much is in the bank account, how much is going out in payroll. And you contrast the two policies that you brought up. And that's the difference with Trump is that he's been in the workforce. He's signed paychecks. He knows what people care about and, and their struggles. He's He might be a billionaire, but it's funny. I've walked hotels with him and he'll stop and talk to the workers and make suggestions and ask how they're doing or whatever. He, he, he sees them and he relates to them. Um, in a way that you normally would go, wow, you're a billionaire and yet you're still connecting with them. Yeah. Um, I, I just interviewed uh, Bernie Moreno in Ohio, who's running to unseat Sherrod Brown. And he pointed out in that interview that Sherrod Brown went from right out of school into government during Nixon's presidency. And he's been milking the American taxpayer and government. He literally has zero workforce experience. And yet he tells business owners, entrepreneurs, middle class workers, blue collar workers, uh, you know, how to run their lives and their families. This guy literally has no life experience outside of, you know, getting a, a guaranteed paycheck from the government. So hopefully he unseats him and we've got J.D. Vance. Uh, and Bernie Moreno, two, two Republicans. Well, and, and, and the difference, right? Again, getting back to this contrast that exists, Bernie Moreno is an American success story. The guy built this business, car dealerships and, and uh, out of nothing. And he worked hard. And um, so I, I love it because it really does go to the difference. When you can send someone to Washington who understands what it's like to build a business, to understand how regulations and taxes impact their ability to succeed and to hire more people and to maintain a, a, a workforce. That's huge. And I think that's what's missing so much. It's, you know, I, I have these people on my show all the time from members of Congress and I'll ask them about spending priorities. And the thing that was funny is I remind them in 1994, when Newt Gingrich was running to take the house, he wanted to be speaker. He wanted to take the majority over for the first time in 50 years. He brought around an ice bucket and he would talk about the fact that since the 1800s, ice was delivered to every congressional office every morning. Now, you may not have even ever visited the Capitol, but you can probably guess that they can now make ice. We have the technology that allows us to do that. And yet, why? Why did Congress keep doing this? Well, despite the fact that they all had refrigerators and freezers in their offices now, there's some kid's uncle who had a patronage job that's probably like 10 people now, and it was costing hundreds of thousands of dollars to deliver ice to every member's door. And what would they do? They would take the ice and then they'd pour it in the sink next to the freezer that they have in their office now. And Newt walked around and he said, you know, if you put us in the majority, we're going to care about your money and we're going to get rid of stupid things like this, like this ice. It's a few hundred thousand dollars, but it matters. And when I have these members of Congress on my show, I always say to them, like, why are we missing the basics anymore? It's like you guys have now had like this threshold. If it's not a trillion dollars, we're not even going to try to save money anymore. And I really do feel like the business people, the Bernie Morenos who get elected, who've had to worry about, you know, 
the bottom line, how much money they're bringing in versus how much they're spending, we'll get this a lot more. And that's why I get excited because I'm so tired of watching Washington just look at like our tax dollars as if it's monopoly money. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I've been discussing this with my brother-in-law from Colorado the last couple of days where it's like, you know, if my tax money was used for like, okay, so here's what I was saying is like, I saw this drone footage of Shanghai and I was like, wow, imagine if we invested money back in our cities and people, we would look like Shanghai versus always being at war, right? Same thing. Like I, I look at um, like Dubai, Dubai, no crime, it's clean, you know, but it's because they're reinvesting in their cities all the time. And I understand sometimes you have to go to war. Sometimes you have to defend your people. But I just think about how much money we spend on war uh, that, that could be going back to our school systems, infrastructure, things like that. So uh, yes, having a business minded person in Washington, D.C., uh, I believe is a big deal. Why, Sean, why do you think all of a sudden, and I love this, I've been, I've been trying to, you know, push for this, but why do you think all of a sudden the black community and the Hispanic community are paying so much attention to Donald Trump? Because he's paying attention to them. I mean, that's, that's the reality is Republicans. And I spent six years at the RNC. I think Republicans so often look at voting populations like math equations and say, well, there's only this percent that I possibly could get and that will yield this much. And therefore, is it worth it or not? That's the fundamental way that I think most Republicans look at it. I think Trump just fundamentally looks at it completely different. And he says, like, if I can get you and you and you and look where he's gone, South Bronx, uh, San Francisco, New Jersey. Um, but it sends a signal as a political person, I'm not sure I would have sent him to every one of those places, but I get why he's doing it. It sends a signal that I care about all of you, whether I'm going to win New Jersey or not, I'm actually going into this neighborhood that nobody ever would from a Republican. And it sends a signal because campaigns aren't like they were 20 years ago, where it's like, you have to go to every neighborhood. When you go to the South Bronx, people in you know South LA will see you or South Bozeman, Montana. I mean, like, you can, the way that the communications work now, it's like when you do a big event because of the internet and because of shows and outlets that are streaming the events, it's not like it's being confined because of the coverage of local media. So the fundamental thing in my thing is that one, he's going there. Two, he's talking about things that matter to them. And he's talking about business and taxes and government regulation and not pandering. It's funny, you know, I was watching some of the Dems react to the question that you were just asking over the last couple of days when they get asked this question, why is Joe Biden not doing as well with the black community? And so many of them will pander with the answer and say, because they're not aware of all of the money that we're spending in the black community as if the black community is monolithic or the Hispanic community or what have you. And all they want is more government right? That's the answer of the left. Well, they just don't know about all this money as opposed to, I think the message that Trump is sending, which is, I want to help you succeed. I want you to grow a business. I want you to be able to go to an HBCU and, and have the opportunities that somebody else did. And I think that that's the big difference is that how he's approaching this matters and where he's going matters. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I love that. Uh, they're paying attention to him because he's paying attention to them. Um, speaking of paying attention, there's going to be a town hall between Elon Musk and Donald Trump. How do you think this will go? Is this going to break records? Is he going to uh, capture uh, the ears of people that normally he's not able to reach? Look, I think getting, I mean, this gets back to the last thing you just asked. I mean, Trump is going places physically to South Bronx, San Francisco, New Jersey, Wildwood, but he's also doing things. I mean, look at the platforms that he's going on. He just did this like hour and 10 minute thing with Dr. Phil and it got rave reviews. Um, and, and so you do a thing with Elon and I don't know that Elon, I mean, I remember Elon did this Twitter spaces thing with DeSantis when he kicked off, but I think doing a town hall with him is going to bring in an audience that's not normal. 
um, it's going to get the high level folks, the smart, you know, investor types that Elon hangs out with. But I think there's a lot of people that are just fascinated by Elon Musk and his success and that will tune into, I mean, you look at the retweets that he gets and the number of people that follow him, et cetera. So I think it's huge, but it gets back to this notion that Trump is going and doing places that a traditional campaign might not do. And, um, and I'm glad to see it. It's not, it's, it's he, the, the number and type of outlets that he's doing is fascinating. And I think that it's brilliant. Yeah. I, I think the, the Dr. Phil one might have been dangerous because Dr. Phil's questions really humanized Donald Trump and made people, I think, see him in a new light where it's like, wow, wait a minute. This is just another American guy who's doing his best to help the country. I, I, I loved it. I thought that he uh, really humanized him. You know, it's funny. When I, um, when I started at Newsmax, they brought in um, a couple media trainers. And one of the things that was fascinating to me, and I learned a lot, was how you ask a question matters, right? What do you want to get out of the guest? And because, and once you start to pay attention to this, once you watch interviews, the question is, are you watching the host or are you watching the interviewee? And a lot of times it's the question that, that drives that. And I was, when you were just saying that, I was thinking to myself, it, that was so true because the way and the type of question that Dr. Phil asked evoked such a different answer and mindset. I was watching Trump during that exchange. The, the way that Dr. Phil approached it, I think put him at ease. You know, at one point he was talking about the fact that like, you're so good at getting in heads and you make people cry and da, 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 da. <laughs> and there was one other interview. I remember after the 2016 election, we were having dinner at Bedminster. Um, Harvey Levin of TMZ had just done a documentary of Trump. It aired on Fox, but it was Harvey Levin going with Trump to his, to Trump tower. And they walked a little and he asked a series of questions and talked about his childhood. And I remember telling Trump afterwards, we were sitting at dinner. I said, I just watched this um, documentary that Harvey Levin did with you. And I, I said, I learned more about you in an hour than I have over the last couple of years. And it was a very, it was a very interesting, I mean, Trump was like, really, you like it? And I, but I, he had gotten Trump into a place that he normally isn't. And I think part of it was when it was filmed, it was a little before the election when it was actually filmed. So Trump wasn't necessarily on his guard the same way he is now, but I thought the same thing with Dr. Phil. He got Trump to a level of comfort that brought out a lot more. And, um, and I think it was a, it was a job well done. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I thought it was masterful. And Trump, some of Trump's responses, you know, about how all of the lawfare and the, the ugliness of politics, how it affects Melania. And he said, you know, I, I wish it could just affect me and not her. You know, again, it just it just humanized him. It was such a such a great interview. Um, do you I have to imagine Democrats and these lawfare uh, attacks on Trump, these people are just frothing at the mouth to jail him. And yet they are terrified the, the consequence will be he'll become a pre he'll become president of the United States. What, what are your thoughts? Are they are they going to actually jail him? Because they have run out of trials that will happen before the election. Uh, they're they're running out of ideas. I know that they've already got different things lined up for if he actually wins, uh, probably the CIA and the legal system. But what are your thoughts? Are they going to actually jail him? Maybe, but let me tell you what I, here's what I, so let's go back. I mean, you mentioned some of this, or I think this is 2016 was the, the, the Russia hoax, um, the illegitimacy of Trump's win. 2020 was the laptop. 2024, they tried to kick him off the ballot in multiple states. They've come after him with four different cases. This is all about branding. And I want people to understand that because he's not, I mean, will he go to jail or be sentenced to jail maybe on July 11th? But this isn't about him actually going to jail. 
This is about a bumper sticker, a branding exercise. They want to be able to say he's a convicted felon. How can you listen to the question? It was, this was teed up so beautifully. They put the ball on the tee. They, I mean, it was the, from the jump. We knew the outcome. It was in Manhattan, 95 to five, you know, not Trump country. They knew the outcome. All they wanted to do was to be able to run against a convicted felon. Remember, this was a misdemeanor charge, a misdemeanor charge, bookkeeping past the statute of limitations. So why did they do everything they did? They did it as part of a branding exercise. They want to run around and say, he's a convicted felon. How could you possibly vote for a convicted felon? You're undermining the rule of law and democracy. And what would the country, I mean, this wasn't about him actually going to jail and serving and the rule of law and all that crap. This was about a branding exercise to be able to say, see, He's a felon and that's it. And so I don't, I mean, look, I wouldn't put it past Judge Marshawn to sentence him. They will immediately let him appeal. He will. I think he will be let go. But just remember this, there is no world, none, in which he will be vindicated before the election. Not going to happen. So why? The answer, as I said, it's simple. It's like the border that we were just discussing. What is the real motive and goal here? The real motive and goal is to be able to say, oh my God, he was convicted. He's supposed to be in jail. How could you possibly vote for this guy? He's a convicted felon that was sentenced to jail. He was convicted of a bookkeeping offense, and yet they want to brand him as if he robbed somewhere or he murdered someone. That's When you think of felon, what do you think of? It's a murderer. It's a car thief. It's a a charge of vandalism or breaking and entering or something like that. It's not a guy who, who said, I, this is a legal fee in the ledger of my own company. This was purely an attempt to ensure that they had the talking points they needed for this election because they've tried to do everything else, uh, including throw the kitchen sink at the guy. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've, I've had in my own business where the IRS has come back and said, hey, uh, we, we think that you reported this wrong. And we defended ourselves and we won. And we had other times where they said, actually, no, we think that this was classified wrong. And then what do they do? They take that number, they figure out the, the tax on that number and a small fee and you pay it and everybody moves on. You don't become a felon. Well, <laughs> just to, to, two things to make clear on that, because you're right. I mean, number one, though, Hillary Clinton in 2016 classified the Steele dossier as a legal expense. The Federal Election Commission said, no way, Jose, and they gave her a fine. She paid it, and as you said, with your IRS example, everybody moved on. Seven years after the fact, the Federal Election Commission passed on Donald Trump and said, we don't see anything here. The Department of Justice passed. The DA prior to Alvin Bragg passed. Alvin Bragg initially passed. In fact, Multiple people resigned from his office because he passed. And yet they still say that somehow this local attorney, and let's remember it's New York City, but he's still a local attorney, is charging Trump, not even charging him, that's actually a whole separate issue, but is trying to make a case for federal election law being broken that he has zero, zero jurisdiction over. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, when you can see behind the curtain and see it for what it really is. It's like, what a waste of taxpayer money. What a waste of time. Um, OK, speaking of court cases and our final minutes together, what are your thoughts on the Hunter Biden court case? I mean, I am like what's come out about this guy. And I, and I have a copy, a paper copy of his laptop. It's it's full of disgustingness. Um, how Joe Biden can say, this is the smartest man I know. Like, okay, I understand like building up your children, but this is a grown man. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he uh, in order to comfort his sister-in-law after his brother dies of brain cancer, he sleeps with her and gets her addicted to illegal drugs. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on, on this court case with Hunter Biden? All right, so I want to talk about two things in my answer to you. Number one, his case, and number two, how that contrasts with Trump. So let's let's walk through what, what 
and remember, this is just one of several. Like he still owes taxes. He still has a bunch of other things. The only reason that we're here is because he got a sweetheart deal that he rejected. So for all the folks on the left who talk about, well, this shows that Joe Biden's DOJ will go after anyone. No, 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 no. They offered Hunter Biden the sweetest of sweetheart deals. He turned it down because he wanted immunity from everything that he had possibly ever done as part of the deal. And the judge was like, no. So the only reason that we're actually prosecuting this drug, it would have gone away. It would have been expunged. He would have had to go into like some don't be a stupid class. And that's it. And we wouldn't have been here. So let's actually look at the merits of what's happening. He purchased a gun and on a federal firearms application, it asked if you are a current user of illegal drugs. He wrote a book, a book where he talks about using illegal drugs at the time. They played the audio tape of his book for the jury. Then there are text messages that he is sending, apparently trying to hook up with a dude named Mookie. And I got to be honest with you, no offense to the guy's name Mookie, but if your name's Mookie, you're probably selling drugs. And, and so he's texting Mookie asking where he can get additional drugs. And then he's admitting that it doesn't matter what city he's in. At this point, he can find crack in any city in America. And so he fills out this federal firearms application to get a gun that then the wife of his brother, who he's now sleeping with, takes and throws in a trash can near a school. So for Democrats who talk about people not having guns that shouldn't have guns and restricting access to law-abiding citizens, here is exhibit number one. Why are you not outraged? The next time that you want to crack down on guns, maybe start with people who lie on federal firearms applications or current drug users. But those would be the first two I would start with. Um, so that's, that's the big thing about understanding his case. Now, it's in Delaware where everybody knows the Bidens. They've been in power for 50 years. It's like the courthouse is named for them or something. Um, I don't think he's going to get found guilty, despite all of the evidence, despite the fact that his fingerprint are in the case that it was that the gun was stored with drug residue. I mean, th like I said, no matter all of that, this is like should be a slam dunk case. Um, the irony is when you compare it to Trump, right? So Trump has a jury 95 to five that hate him. I think it's 99 to one in Biden's case that like him. They've already showed that several people on the jury in the Biden case have had a history of substance abuse or a family member that has dealt with it. So they're going to be very sympathetic. In Trump's case, there was never a connection to him saying, you know, that the bookkeeping offense was ordered by him. There's no connection. It was all Michael Cohen's word, a convicted perjurer and liar. In Hunter's case, as I said, his own words from his own book have been brought into evidence. The laptop that was supposedly Russian disinformation is exhibit, what, 16 of the U.S. government. It could not be a clearer contrast. And yet in Trump's case, he was found guilty ridiculously. And in Hunter's case, I will predict that he gets off. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that you're right. Um, everything I've been reading about the jury, uh, it, it's, you know, and they're, and they're saying, you know, have, you have like Representative Dan Goldman that's like, Joe Biden believes in the law so much, he's letting his son go through this case to prove that the law is good. Uh, and it's like, But as I said, the, the funny part about that stupid statement from Dan Goldman is he didn't let him go through. They tried to get him off. They were like, here, here is a sweetheart deal. Take the sweetheart deal. He just got so over his skis by saying, well, wait a second. I, I, uh, I'm not, you know, I, I, I want immunity for everything. And my question has always been, what else did you do that you need oh. immunity? Right? No, no, think about that. You have a deal that deals with the taxes. Another thing that Dems supposedly claim that rich people should pay except when you're Hunter Biden, also doesn't pay child support, doesn't acknowledge his kid. Anywho, all of this is wrapped into one big ball and the gun charge goes away if you just sign this deal. And they reject it out of hand because there's they want qualified immunity for everything. And the big question that I keep asking that no one else will is, what else were you guilty of that you don't want people to know? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I didn't even think of that. And uh, that is a really... 
good point, especially now that they can they can actually acknowledge the laptop and dig in. There's a lot of underage children. You do have to wonder book. now, Stephen, like, was that cocaine in the White House really hunters? And he's like, oh, crap. I need this as part of that deal so that I don't get busted on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sean, thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, I'm going to put a link down below to your YouTube channel uh, you. as well as over on Twitter uh, so that people can follow you, check out your show. You have some incredible guests uh, that come on. And uh, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, we'll this have you like on. This is like Saturday Night Live. At like five, do I, I want to get like a jacket or something. You know how they always say like he's the Steve Martin when he got to the... So I, I feel like I, I need like a Stephen Gardner jacket when I get to five. Yeah, I, I should come up with that. Right? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really Maybe good a point. I, should... I don't know. Like I don't want to blow the budget of the show. Yeah. <laughs> well, the budget keeps going up thanks to thanks inflation. So... Well, thank you again for coming on. I'll put those links down below and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Stephen.